Hello and welcome to Projector, and on this episode, Ewan McGregor and Naomi Harris get caught in a web of espionage in John le Carre's Our Kind of Traitor. Perry and Gale, played by Ewan McGregor and Naomi Harris, are on holiday in Morocco when they meet Dima, played by Stellan Skarsgård, whom Perry befriends. Dima reveals himself to be a money launderer for the Russian Mafia, who wants to turn informant, giving Perry details of politicians and officials being paid to bring the mob's money into London, which Perry brings to MI6 and Damien Lewis's Hector. In exchange for proof, Dima wants asylum for himself and his family, but only if Perry and Gale use his intermediary and must do so before the Mafia catches up with them. John le Carre's work has been adapted for the screen many times before, be it film or television, with the likes of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, The Constant Gardener, A Most Wanted Man, and The Tailor of Panama, among others, and his espionage thrillers that are rooted in the author's own time in the intelligence industry, working in MI5 and MI6 in the 1950s and 60s, makes them well suited for adaptation, although interest in le Carre's work is especially skyrocketed this year thanks to the BBC adaptation of the Night Manager with Tom Hiddleston, Hugh Laurie, which was a hugely gripping, fantastic piece of television. It really shows what someone could do with this kind of material. And the one that I'm reviewing here, Our Kind of Traitor, it premiered in the UK only a couple of weeks after the Night Manager finished over here, and the problem with this movie is that although it's not a bad film by any stretch of the imagination, the fact that it comes straight after the Night Manager only makes it look paler by comparison, unfortunately. There's a reason that the Carrie's work appeals to filmmakers, and the first is obviously the author's history that gives his stories a certain amount of verisimilitude and authenticity or to put it more accurately, bureaucracy, that really makes you feel like you're a part of that shadowy cloak and dagger world. But the other reason that filmmakers find themselves drawn to the carry is that they're very much character pieces. They're almost the antithesis of James Bond. It's not about action and gunplay. It's all about intrigue and suspense. And you, you're following around these characters that are often very flawed, carrying secrets and deceptions of their own. And when it comes to our kind of traitor, we have a quite strong set of characters that are very interesting to watch. Take, for example, Ewan McGregor and Naomi Harris as Perry and Gale. When we first meet them in Morocco, it's very clear that their relationship is on the rocks, that something is dividing them and they're not really on the same page anymore and it soon becomes established that Perry has slept with another woman, and there's this real tension between them, especially because Gail is a very high-powered lawyer, very much the more powerful part of that relationship, whereas Perry works as a lecturer at a university, and he, he feels that he has lost his masculinity, so to speak, and it's interesting to see that dynamic play out, and how they are sort of forced to end up working together in spite of the fact that their relationship is is very much a tumultuous one at best. And in some ways it, it does bring them together closer and try I used to reforge some of the differences they have between each other. And I I really like the idea that they were they were struggling against, against their their own selves. But the problem with that idea is that the movie, after a certain point, I think the movie kind of abandons that particular idea. There is a certain point where that just stops being a thing that's mentioned. I think as the movie m moves more into the suspense portion in its later sections, that initial infidelity subplot and their relationship takes a backseat. Alas, while McGregor has a lot of material to work with, Harris, the current money penny, is somewhat given the short shrift here, essentially being this surrogate mother figure to Dima's children and trying to protect them, and it's a bit of a thankless role in the last portion of the movie, especially when the character is established as being quite a powerful figure in, a, in her own right, and then that gradually gets sidelined throughout the movie, unfortunately. But as I said, McGregor is very much the main character here, and his arc is very much about masculinity, 
and enter Stellan Skarsgård as Dima. And Skarsgård is great in this movie. He plays Dima as this larger than life, gregarious character throwing these huge extravagant parties. This character has so many layers to him because he is this family man. He has a family that he needs to protect and he is aware that his that his time is up. He is in, in grave danger. And while he has this friendly persona to Perry, he's also this very violent figure. He His body is branded in tattoos for the Russian mafia that he, he found in prison. And Skarsgård is so compelling because while he's dangerous, he's also vulnerable because he's He's risking the lives of himself and his family, and if this all goes wrong, they're all dead. But at the same time, he's carrying this with such a calm, cool, collected manner that really benefits a man who has spent his life surrounded by violence and is not going to let the threat of it distract him. And when it comes to the relationship between himself and Perry, it's clear that they both see it to their mutual advantage, because Perry sees Dima as this very confident, hyper-masculine figure that gives him a chance to reclaim some of his manhood. This is almost presented like an adventure, an excitement for him. Whereas, on the other hand, Dima, he sees in Perry the closest thing to an honest, noble man. He sees a chance for escape. He sees something heroic about him. And there's something really interesting about that dynamic, especially because the two actors, McGregor and Skarsgård, they really work well together and they have a certain amount of genuine charm and camaraderie together. But coming close to Skarsgård's performance in this film is Damien Lewis as Hector, the MI6 agent, and Lewis goes about this role in a very unusual kind of way, with the glasses and the accent. There's something about him that's really kind of reptilian that makes you uncertain if you want to trust him, which is about right for this character. I think the easiest way that you could describe him is, imagine Smiley, especially Gary Oldman's portrayal of him in Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, imagine a younger version of him if he was kind of a bastard. He does have this moral code of right and wrong that powers his actions, but his the way that he goes about them is not entirely ethical, and that's partly because he's driven by personal vendetta. He really wants to bring down the former MI6 chief, who has since stepped down, surrounded by corruption, because he knows that he is involved in this Russian money laundering deal, and he is determined to prove that, partly to vindicate himself. There's also the, the fact that he's going about this mission by himself, in that he's trying, he's trying to do this as essentially a one-man job. But he's not letting anyone else know this. He's not letting Perry and Gale know that while he brings them into this as additional, as additional field personnel, essentially. He doesn't really let on that no one else at MI6 is really chasing this idea except for him. And the tension in this movie, to some extent, is when his lies is going to catch up to them and and really cost them in the most grave way. And this theme of corruption and this idea of Russian mafia money finding its way into the London infrastructure, it feels very timely and very much ripped from the headlines. And although the Carrie is most well known for writing Cold War thrillers, this is actually based off a much more recent book of his that was first published in 2010. But even still, those Cold War tensions haven't entirely gone away. And in some ways, the threat from Russia is a lot more insidious with this idea that people are willing to turn a blind eye to it. That's what Hector finds, is that people want to ignore this because it's bringing money into the economy. There is a sense that this is very much rooted in the real world, especially because one of the first instances that we meet uh, Lewis's Hector is at the uh, Arsenal's Emirates Stadium, and it very much mixes this very public football game 
with the private party and handshaking of all the people making these deals. The difference between a Lacari of the 60s and a Lacari now is very much about technology. There's very much about USB sticks and laptops and emails and information. The sort of methods of intelligence has really changed in that period of time. One thing that shouldn't surprise you if you're familiar with the carry on screen is that it's quite a slow burner because it's building these characters towards the tense finale. However, I do feel that Archive Traitor does have problems with its, with its script, which is written by Hussein Armini, who wrote Drive, and previously had quite a successful directorial outing with The Two Faces of January, the Patricia Highsmith novel. Although this has the certain kind of elegance that he brings to projects like this, it does feel like it's a little unsteady on its feet. It doesn't quite invest the audience in the way it really should until it sort of moves into the tension later on in the movie. I think then the movie really finds its feet. And I think that's also partly to do with the direction. This, this movie is directed by Susanna White, and what White brings to this project in terms of her direction is a real kind of skill to the suspense set pieces. She brings a certain amount of style to it. There are two sequences in particular that really work effectively. The first is when they're attempting to rescue Dima's children from a museum. The way that sequence is staged is fantastic because although it's in this very public, supposedly friendly place, they've shot this sequence at either low or Dutch angles that makes the geography of it intentionally obscured and it makes it feel almost kind of maze-like. That sequence is very, very well done, but the one that really stuck out in my mind happens late in the film, because there's a shootout, and the, much of this movie's tension comes from the fish-out-of-water scenario, that these are outsiders playing in this very dangerous world, and they don't know who to trust. They've chosen to stage this scene so that Perry has been armed with a gun hiding in, in the basement and he makes the decision to come out and what we and initially all we hear is the sound of gunshots. It's very much about what you don't see. Weiss also has a lot of fun with this recurring motif of the antique gun that appears as a harbinger of death. You receive the gun, you're going to die next. And that is established very early on but I had fun seeing that come back into the movie and then being subverted. I think that's actually quite clever in the way that that changes meaning and and, and the sort of symbolism of it. I think that, that is actually genuinely intelligent. However, as a whole, in terms of the Carrie's work on screen, it sits comfortably in the middle. There's something about it that, while it's competent, it doesn't quite feel distinctive. It's, and it just feels like another ran, especially because it's following in the footsteps of the far superior, the Night Manager. Our kind of traitor is a largely standard John the Carry adaptation, despite its modern setting, no more, no less, and doesn't quite have the same pull as the Night Manager. The all-star cast are playing these very layered, quite flawed characters that you find yourself gradually being drawn into, with Skarsgård and Lewis being especially good, and its topical subject matter is engaging and lends an air of authenticity, even if the very deliberate pacing might put some viewers off. Susanna White does a good job of adding some cinematic style and suspenseful direction, managing to capture a sense of the old spy films of yesteryear and emphasising the tension of its fish-out-of-water scenario. If you like the carry, it's worth watching, but it's fairly average without doing much to distinguish itself. Coming up soon, Jennifer Saunders and Joanna Lumley are absolutely fabulous, Kelsey Grammer's Breaking the Bank comes off the shelf, and we discover the adventures of the secret life of pets. But until then, I'm Matthew Buck, fading out.